welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 13 of the Madden America podcast. This week we continue our interview with Dr. Peter Bregin. Dr. Bregin is a Harvard-trained psychiatrist and former consultant at the National Institute of Mental Health. He has been called the conscience of psychiatry for his many decades of successful efforts to reform the mental health field. His work provides the foundation for modern criticism of psychiatric diagnoses and drugs, and leads the way in promoting more caring and effective therapies. His research and educational projects have brought about major changes in the FDA-approved full prescribing information or labels for dozens of antipsychotic and antidepressant drugs. He continues to educate the public and professions about the tragic psychiatric drugging of America's children. He has authored dozens of scientific articles and more than 20 books, including medical books and the bestsellers Toxic Psychiatry and Talking Back to Prozac. His most recent book is Guilt, Shame and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions. As a medical legal expert, Dr. Bregin has unprecedented and unique knowledge about how the pharmaceutical industry too often commits fraud in researching and marketing psychiatric drugs. He has testified many times in malpractice, product liability and criminal cases, often in relation to adverse drug effects and more occasionally electroshock and psychosurgery. Dr. Bregin has taught at many universities and has a private practice of psychiatry in Ithaca, New York. In this part of the interview, we catch up on events surrounding the trial of Michelle Carter. You may recall that the district attorney in the case was trying to limit Dr. Bregin's right to blog about the trial. We also go on to talk about alternatives to psychiatric drugs and how Dr. Bregin approaches working with clients who may be heavily influenced by the biomedical model of mental illness. Dr. Bregin, thank you so much for talking with me today for the podcast. It's long been an ambition of mine to be able to chat with you, and I'm very grateful to you for making the time for this. To begin with, I wanted to ask about recent events with the Michelle Carter trial, because the last time we spoke, there were attempts to limit your right to free speech that could potentially affect your blogging about the trial on Madden America. I also wanted to ask how you felt about the outcome of the trial, in which Michelle received a sentence of 15 months, which I think was suspended. Is that correct? Not suspended, but it's called a stay. So okay. it would did not go, won't go into action until she has the opportunity to go through the appeal process. Because the judge sees this as a case that has a lot of potential appeal to it. Right. Uh, it's just a freedom of speech and other appeal issues that are outside of anything I testified about. Yep. And maybe other things too. Um, so. Uh, if she lost all her appeals two or three years from now, then the judge would have to consider you know, sending her to the wimp, to uh, the House of Corrections, which is a, a mild imprisonment for 15 months rather than the, I think it was 12 to 15 years that the prosecution wanted in the state pen. Peter, I wanted to thank you for the blogs on Madden America because... It gives people like me the chance to see inside the courtroom and understand the details that may not be reported anywhere else. For example, you beautifully describe how just a few lines from a long text that Michelle sent were almost used out of context but became the main plank of the case. But you setting out the whole exchange puts a completely different complexion on it. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, one of the things I like the best, which didn't occur to me for, uh, until I started to work on, on, on the fourth blog, and which is now out, was that, well, what would happen if they took other quotes out of context? <laughs> Why just pick that one? For at one point, she says uh, that uh, that is Conrad, her boyfriend, forced her to have sex with him. That's rape in the U.S. Mm. Now I don't imagine that if he had lived that the DA would have brought charges of rape against him based on the fact that in fact at another point she said she had never even had sex up to that same time. So we have two, two dramatically different reports from her that really show that her imagination, her reporting is, is often dramatic but not accurate, um, perhaps because of the psychiatric drugs, perhaps because of all the pressures she's under. And her anorexia, perhaps uh, because she's uh, between 15 and 17 years old during this period of time. Mm. But that really struck me when I realized that and wrote that down, that if this 
you know, would we take seriously her describing him as, as having uh, assaulted her? Or would we have put it in context and said, well, at other times, speaking about that same time period, she says she hasn't had intercourse with anybody and she doesn't describe him as forcing her. It's such a stretch that the DA made. And because it was such a stretch, I believe that what the DA decided to do was to make her a terrible villain, that that was the that was the only answer. And they succeeded with the public and, and perhaps with the judge. And I try to explain how those distortions were made. Now, in the next blog is going to be re- very interesting because there's there's going to be even more material, which if it had been allowed in court, would have given evidence that she couldn't possibly have done what she's accused of doing. Mm-hmm. So then, so then we get into the the American judicial system, which perhaps rightly vastly limits at times what can come in to court. But we'll see in this case that uh, uh, this other material we have uh, suggests that the entire scenario is impossible. That mm-hmm. she, she couldn't have been even talking to him within hours of his death. So that's going to be interesting to point out and look at. And uh, then we're going to go in and look at, you know, who's really guilty here? Uh, You know, who's guilty for this whole scenario, for everything that's been happening here? Is it these two kids, these two young people, or is it something else? Is it other adults? Is it society? And I want to look some more, a little bit more to psychiatric drugs, but I've been doing that throughout. To me, this this is a model of America right now and the world, about what's the Western world in particular, the industrialized nations, what's happening to our children in the society. You know, I'm hoping that this that this blog becomes a kind of a, a short book, a model for me at least, in, in my effort to show just what psychiatry and the and other social forces are doing to children right now. Well, the blog does that very powerfully, Dr. Bregin, and it feels like looking at someone who struggles with their mental health, but judging them and medicating them based on a tiny period of a few weeks, it's not representative of the whole, is it? No, no. And these kids don't get off the drugs. I mean, she's put on these drugs when, when she's 14 years old, and um, she gets off them for, for a few months at one point, but uh, you know, they just put her right back on, and the minute she, minute she thinks it might help her, bang, they put her back on. They don't discuss, as far as I can tell, any of the implications with her or her parents about uh, what information she was given or wasn't given. So it's a very bad situation. Dr. Bregan, could you tell us how things stand now with your blogging and writing about the trial? But let me let me address what happened with the uh, the judge a little more. The um, When my first blog and second blog came out, and uh, my first one was, was uh, viewed by 30,000 people, uh, I, th- I think the DA thought, my God, we're losing control of the narrative and um, we're losing control of the story of Mean Michelle and this great victory in getting her criminalized and made into a criminal. Uh, uh, and, and also they were angry because she only got 15 months. So and they, let the, they let that be known publicly. So there was a bunch of things going on. And then uh, along come I and I begin to tell the other story that never really got out through the media. And some of it, for various reasons, not into the courtroom, because the courtroom is not the sort of place where everything comes out. Mm. And by everything coming out, I don't mean anybody's medical records that have been uh, uh, embargoed. I mean things that are going on in the world around Michelle that that wouldn't necessarily come out uh, under the court system. Mm. And uh, I think the DA uh, decided that they were just going to go squelch me and scare me and uh, and suppress me and uh, continue their story. Not only now would Michelle be uh, cast into disrepute, but also her expert, Peter Bregan. So they made a lot of, of, of weird accusations against me to the judge that I was breaking various uh, ethics uh, standards. And of course, the, uh, right away, it was a giveaway. They didn't attach any of those ethics standards because none of them pertain to what I was doing. And they they said, I planned, I planned to put up the embargoed medical records on my Michelle Carter archive. Hmm. But it's called the Michelle Carter Archive. It's not called the Michelle Carter and uh, Conrad Roy Archive. So they made that up out of whole cloth. And they did a bunch of things like that, which they, I believe, were doing with Michelle all along, too. And then um, 
they got the judge to do the emergency hearing on the basis of all these accusations, at which I wasn't present, and my natural allies, which would have been Michelle's lawyers, overnight couldn't be present. One was on vacation, one was on uh, a trial. Very clever on the part of the DA. But after the judge read it all over, I sent in a letter and we sent it right to the judge. We sent it to the prosecution. And we also sent it through the, um, uh, the defense attorneys. I did not go to court. I did not uh, believe. And I think the judge was not at all certain. He reportedly said in court, we don't have transcripts, that he wasn't even sure he had any jurisdiction over me, that all he could do would, would be to tell Michelle's lawyers, you know, what, what the rules were. Um, and then they would have to talk with me. So we did not appear in court, but we, the judge did accept the letters, which uh, the letter from me, which was very good that he did that without demanding that I appear. And um, then he, he took his time. And on the September 1st, he issued his uh, response to all of this. And there's not a word of criticism of, of me in his response. And I, and I put that up on the. Um, on the blog, you can get right to that. It's uh, number 60 of the um, uh, public uh, documents that I put on, on, the, on, the, uh, on my website, but you can get directly to it from the blog on, on uh, MIA. Yeah. And he made no mention at all of censoring me in any way whatsoever or criticizing me. He just reaffirmed that um, he uh, that, it, that it was understood, and I said it was understood, that uh, I was not going to use embargoed material from the medical records of the boy who committed suicide, and that I had written permission from Michelle Carter to use uh, her medical records and other documents of hers for this blog. So <clears throat> in that way, the judge didn't censor the DA, which would have been nice, but I didn't expect him to do that. Um, and uh, judges rarely, rarely do that in America. And um, instead, um, he just didn't. He just didn't go with anything the DA said. Hmm. So I'm on my own now again. I would have continued to publish my blog anyway, and I did publish before September 1st, because it just took so long. I wanted to respect the judicial process, but it took so long to get the response from him from uh, August 21st to September 1st that I went ahead and a couple of days before I knew that his response was coming, I, I published um, number three, and now I've published number four. Well, the behavior of the district attorney doesn't seem to be the behavior of someone who's completely confident in their case. That's well put. I might quote you. The behavior of the DA does not look, unless, unless you don't want to have the DA <laughs> mad at you from the U.S. <laughs> but um, yes, that's, that's I think, completely true. And um, th I believe that very strongly. I think this case is going to be overturned on one of a number of issues. But while I appreciate very much the suffering of the family of Conrad Roy, and I do, because he didn't tell them how bad it was. Mm. He didn't tell anybody how bad it was. And uh, we have that from the emails. We don't have to go into his records. We know from the emails that he's telling Michelle, he laughs and says, I don't, I don't tell my therapist I'm suicidal. So that Michelle was getting it all. So the family didn't know how bad it was. So I thoroughly understand the huge loss. There's nothing more horrible in life than a sudden, abrupt, unexpected, traumatic death of your child. Um, right at the age we expect to just see him growing and progressing, but he, he was not telling them anything as far as we know from, from what they've said in public. They had no idea about this. Um, but what about Michelle? She's alive and, and literally was, uh, has been um, tormented by the press. It's amazing how much friends stood by her in terms of having her come back into the high school still giving her a wonderful award as most likely to brighten your day. She got that award after all the negative press coverage, mm. after she was under attack. And, um, but her life is forever uh, changed. And I think that uh, this tragedy is not, not confined to the, the tragic death of Conrad Roy. There's a human being here who's alive, 
who is uh, in generally the most loved youngster I've ever seen when I talk to her teachers, coaches, and friends, and read, read thousands of, of, uh, of texts between her and a wide, wide group of diverse friends. So, you know, I want, I want her voice out there. Mm-hmm. And I also want to be able to say on the basis of this case, uh, just how in jeopardy our children are mm-hmm. and, and the extent that the authorities will go to exclude even the possibility that drugs, psychiatric drugs are playing a role, even though both these kids were on psych drugs. Society, the powers in the society just go to extremes to make sure this message does not get out. But it did get out, and um, we had some great coverage. I I did several segments on uh, one of our biggest uh, news feature shows, 2020, on ABC, and I did um, other TV, and uh, my testimony's up online. You can go up online... um, to Bregan.com and and go to the Michelle Carter blogs and archives, and you'll see the archives. And in the archives, you can easily get to the separate parts of the videos. You can go to the judge's opinion video. You can go to uh, Dr. Bregan's testimony, where I talk a lot about the drugs, draw a wonderful picture on a board showing what happens in the brain very roughly, you know, when you get take these drugs. So there's... This material is going to, I hope, be very important. Mm-hmm. My, my next big question, James, is, is how, how do I then get all of this into some sort of package for people? Or maybe it's just going to be good enough that it's, it's up all in a row on, um, on, on the um, Madden America website, and it's accessible from my website. Um, but I'd like to see a package of this that somehow people could just really distribute well, Dr. Bregan, I'm so grateful that you and others like you are willing to share the unpalatable truth about the involvement of these drugs, because it's far too easy for society to pretend that they're a fix for our problems, and for pharmaceuticals to only tell a story that benefits them and adds to their bottom line, and also too easy for the medical profession to turn a blind eye. So the fact that you make this material accessible is vitally important. Usually I would have put it into uh, a book, I never had a plan to do a book about this case, and I don't have any plan right now. But with uh, with the uh, accessibility now blogging, and really with Madden America, I really want to thank Emmeline, you know, who does the blogs there, and and Robert Whitaker, who who created this site. I mean, that has that has made an especially good platform for all of us. that expands uh, my platform and what I'm doing and the platforms of lots of other people and, and makes uh, such a range of things available. And um, I've, already pro- I've already had more people um, uh, read this blog than many of my books. So um, it's, uh, it's a new world of communications out there. It is, and it's testament to the power of truth, Peter. That's what I feel. Before I became involved with Madden America, I was a regular visitor to the site, and I found it so refreshing that I wasn't being fed diagnoses and chemical imbalances as fact, and it was empowering to read people saying, we don't know what the underlying basis of mental health difficulties are, but that doesn't mean we can't help you. The truth liberates us, but it can be challenging too, can't it? Well, it's been an exciting challenge for me. Um, it's it, One of the things that's interesting to me is that I see a lot of... Um, of people who've been very wounded by um, by psychiatry, mm. and um, many of them would be in quite a position to to take stands. They're uh, professionals in medicine, so many doctors, many lawyers, and but they all kind of get to know me because I'm pretty open about myself as a part of the way I do therapy, and they know what it's like being a reformer. And um, so far, not a single one of my patients who wasn't already a reformer has gone on to become one. So I think they look at me and they say, thank you, Peter, but no thank you for me. <laughs> and of course, I don't push anybody to go in any direction in their lives. So um, when left to their own devices, 
very few people want to do what some of us are doing. Uh, and it's totally understandable. It is. And I've heard from you and others that I've spoken with that occupying that position outside the mainstream is not easy and it's not comfortable, but it's vital. Yes, absolutely. And if I didn't have Ginger, I probably would have given up on this a while ago. I mean, I worked without her and did the whole anti-psychosurgery campaign that pretty much stopped almost all, but not all psychosurgery in the Western world. And I even stopped some of the projects in the Far East. And I did that without her. And um, that was just so incredibly lonely, beyond description. But for the last 35 years, um, see, in the psychosurgery, it was back in 1972 for a five-year period starting in 72. Um, so I haven't been lonely since, since Ginger's arrived on the scene. And she's been so much help. And that's changed it hugely. I, I don't know that I would have been able to continue for 35 years uh, with the same kinds of, you know, relationships I had before Ginger. <laughs> well, you're clearly a wonderful couple, Peter, and I'm so glad that you found each other. I, I think God just had pity on me and and just said, look, <laughs> dopey guy, you know, I'm putting her in front of you again and again. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> And Peter, I wanted to ask you about alternatives to psychiatric drugs, because I was reading Guilt, Shame and Anxiety, Understanding and Overcoming Negative Emotions, your most recent book, and it was talking about the emotional reasons for difficulty and about human connections. And I just wondered how you approach working with clients who may have been brought up with the medical model of mental health and who may be expecting medications. Well, for one thing, it's, a, it's complicated because so much of what a therapist does depends on who comes to him. So um, in my case, I actually tell people who don't know who I am, who call me, who I am before they come to see me. Because I never want somebody coming to see me thinking I'm an ordinary psychiatrist and then being in the situation of, of hearing, well, no, uh, I don't automatically give out drugs, which is what psychiatrists automatically do now. I have a whole different approach, and I like to help people come off drugs. So I talk to people about that on the phone um, if they don't know me. And a lot of people who call me do know me. They're calling for me. But, but some, you know, a lot of people aren't. It's hard to find psychiatrists around here at all. So they may just be looking for a refill of their lithium college student, let's say, from, from Cornell or from Ithaca College. And um, so I always tell people on the phone, so everybody knows who I am when they get to see me. And if they don't know who I am, I not I uh, and I say, well, look, here's my website. Go look at it. See how I'm thinking. And I'd, I'd love to see you if you want to come in. And you should find out in your first session whether you like working with me and whether you're learning. You don't have to wait six weeks or something. Uh, I hopefully you'll 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 really walk out of the first session knowing what we're doing and and uh, with some new helpful approaches. Um, so for me, it isn't a big a big issue of trying to convince people, and I really avoid trying to convince people of anything. And um, I um, I just don't want to be in that role. What I tell people who want to have a big discussion with me about it is. No, I don't want to do that with you. You're you, you know. I've written books. You can see six and eight minute videos. Go look at them, because the last thing I want to do is is um, try to to talk somebody out of their drugs. You're trying to talk me into them. That means kind of puts me in the position, no matter how I conduct myself, of talking you out of them. If I even if I only say this is the information I have, <laughs> it becomes a it becomes a discussion, even an argument which I don't want to have an argument. So I don't get into that position very much. Um, thanks to the media and my radio show and uh, my being, um, you know, a resident psychiatrist on our biggest talk show here in the U S uh, every couple of weeks, I, I go, sometimes more frequently, uh, I go on coast to coast, um, and, and, uh, talk to folks, um, I get to just talk in general to people a lot about the drugs. And my basic view is, uh, you know, people, people are free to, um, to choose their own way in life. 
Um, people smoke cigarettes. They drink alcohol in excess. They eat too much. Uh, they don't exercise. You know, folks. And uh, you know that's that's what it's like being human. But let me tell you what the hazards are of what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Just as I would if I were dressing cigarettes um, or taking some neurotoxin that was uh, uh, being distributed to the young people as a, as a drug. Um, and I explained that the drugs are neurotoxins. They can't fix anything. All they can do is to limit your brain and your mind and your spirit. And that might feel like a relief, but in the long run, it's going to be really bad for your brain and for you. And I'm just very direct about that. So I don't try to convince people on the other side. I let them listen to me, to my books, to this, to what we're doing today. And um, there has been a very big change in the last 10 to 20 years, and that is that Even people who don't agree with me when they call in on talk shows and things are appreciative of of me now. Mm -hmm. So I used to get a terrible amount of hostility and the radio shows would, would, you know, feed those in and so on and so forth. But that isn't happening very, very much. And, um, and that, that's, that's made life a lot better because it's no no, no fun to deal with all the people who are really upset by you. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's been a real sea change in people appreciating what I'm doing and not just me, I think in what Bob Whitaker's doing and Peter Goetz is doing and what you're doing. Um, there's just a lot more appreciation now than there was 10 or 20 years ago. That environment has changed drastically. So we're in a a kind of a, a, a bifurcated situation where on the one hand, more and more people know that they don't want to give these drugs, especially to their children. I feel differently about children than adults. I, I think that that promoting these drugs for adults is, is uh, institutionalized child abuse. Mm. I don't think it's child abuse for the unwitting parent to give these, you know, to go along with it and, and think these drugs are good. But I think uh, the institutions, particularly the pharmaceutical industry and the psychiatric industry, who are the ones that are really kind of control the situation to a great deal, um, I think it's child abuse that um, that my American Psychiatric Association pu- pushes drugs for children um, because th- they can't make any kind of decision. You know, rarely is their opinion respected, and besides, they're not much of a p- position. In fact, many children take these drugs because it pleases their parents and the doctor. Hmm. And when they're told that they're being nicer now, even though they don't know what's happening, they don't know that their behavior is muted, that they're inhibited by the drug, that they're suppressed by the drug. You know, the kids want to please more than anything in the world. Even the most rebellious child in the face of the earth, underneath it would like to please an adult and have an adult love them and take care of them and protect them. He is the angriest child in the world wants that. So, um, you know, it's unfair to even ask the children whether what they think of the drug because it's going to be so distorted by what they think the adult wants them to say in most cases. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I feel differently about the kids. I think we should stop it. I think that we have organized effort now to stop the psychiatric medicating of children. Well, we've had a vivid example of that with Michelle Carter, haven't we? And Conrad Roy, you know, Conrad, uh, and this is something his mother testified to. And, um, and it's something he said to Mich- to Michelle in his emails. I mean, it was I can't remember exactly what it was, maybe 10 days or two weeks, not long before his suicide, he decided to put himself back on these medications. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, obviously he would have needed a doctor to do that, but you know, th- those records are, are embargoed. But he put himself back on the medications. That's incredibly important. Mm-hmm. Because he'd been off for quite a while, and whenever you restart a drug, uh, an antidepressant drug, really almost any drug, cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, you restart the drug after you've been off for a while, and you risk a, a, a more extreme impact starting over again. You're right. Of the many deeply troubling aspects of psychiatric drugs, the drugging of our children is perhaps the most sinister. There can't be informed consent, can there? Because a child can't make that assessment for themselves. Well, and a child who had a really, you know, a natural ability to reason would say, are you crazy? 
I could get obese. I could get breasts. Are you nuts? I might get demented over the years. Follow-up studies show people do better off their drugs. I might get akathisia, which some people say is like being tortured from inside out. What are you talking about? Oh, and it hasn't even been approved for my problem at my age, which is mostly what's going on. And um, in Michelle's case, Selexa that she was put on is specifically rejected by the FDA. Hmm. You know, usually when the FDA rejects a drug, they don't usually put that into the official full prescribing information. In the U.S., we have a full prescribing information. It's also called a package insert. And um, it's officially under the law called the label for the drug. It's uh, It could be 60 typewritten pages long. Hmm. And uh, they just usually say something like um, not approved for children or has not been approved for children. For Selexa, Selexa, which is the drug she was on, they say this drug was not found to, to meet the standards of safety and effectiveness by the FDA. And that's mm. not a quote, but that's what they basically say. Mm. That's pretty dramatic. And so when they asked me in trial, isn't that, a, isn't that a small dose she's getting of Celexa, a, a relatively safe dose? And I said, the FDA has told us there is no safe dose. There is no right dose. There is no good dose of this drug. Mm period. And Michelle has some liver dysfunction from her anorexia. She had anorexia. Um, she'd been suicidal in the past, very suicidal, not long after restarting Prozac and then later going, you know, that was before she went on to Celexa. So, I mean, you had every reason in the world not to give her that drug. And boy, they just you know, the establishment just doesn't want to, to acknowledge that. I'm glad my testimony is all up on um, my website now. And and you can you can get to it, um, you know, through the blogs on MIA and you can get to it from my website. Um, so people can listen to what I actually said in court. Well, it's critical that people hear views other than those paid for or sponsored by the industry so they can make up their own minds about the balance of risk to potential benefits. And we wouldn't know about those risks if it weren't for the work of yourself and others. And Peter, I'm sure you've heard this many times. If you do criticise the drugs used in psychiatry, quite often you get thrown back, well, they're the only option. It's the drugs or nothing. And I just don't feel that's true. And, and I'd like to highlight that there are many other methods for improving your mental health. And I wanted your thoughts on that. Well, yes. Um, the contest isn't even between psychiatric drugs and psychotherapy. We know that, that the fundamental uh, problem, and then John Reed so has, has so confirmed this. So John and I, we were talking about uh, trauma in childhood. Almost everything that is a serious emotional, psychological problem that people cannot recover from has origins in childhood trauma, abuse, neglect, or other things that are out of the control of parents, uh, deaths in the, in the family. Now, some people can get thrown over the edge by other huge trauma in adulthood, like the loss of a child, which uh, Conrad Roy's family had to deal with, the abrupt traumatic loss of a child. Uh, you can get terrible PTSD in wartime and other catastrophes. But by and large, what we see in a... a in most of our practices, is people suffer from things that happen to them in childhood, and they then carry on the emo not only the emotional reactions into adulthood, uh, you know, a, a woman being being terrified uh, after abuse by men and not knowing how to deal with that and struggling with it, uh, a man seeing his father abuse his mother and not knowing what to do about that. Uh, people who simply were neglected, as often happens now, because they had two hard-working, stressed-out parents, and and uh, they, uh, when they were born, they just wouldn't room or time for them. Uh, I mean, it's it's pretty endless all the parameters of of harm that's that can happen in childhood, and then you grow up with emotional reactions to the current world as if it was your past world. 
And it's it's kind of, in some ways, I hadn't thought of this before, but it's kind of like a culture shock. You've grown up under circumstances A, you reach adulthood, circumstances B, you're still reacting uh, in the old way with your emotions. And also you've developed lessons that are bad for you, like uh, you can't trust men or you can't trust women um, or, uh, you know, sex, uh, sex and love don't go together or... Uh, you know, nobody gets a decent job. You have to cheat to get ahead. Um, whatever principles you evolve that really don't work well in adulthood and cause you harm and your loved ones harm. So a lot of what good help is, is about a relationship which allows you to learn what happened in childhood and to have feelings about it, rework those feelings. It allows you to understand the, this, what I call self-defeating principles you got from childhood. And it allows you to build a relationship because human beings are entirely about relationship. We, we're not isolated like male orangutans, orangutans, you know, we're, we're chimps. It's all about relationship for the chimps too, especially mothers and children, but even big brothers. And, and so you now provide somebody a relationship with somebody who's actually caring toward you. I, I believe in love, loving, uh, but within very strict professional limits, very strict professional limits that allow affection and caring to flower. Um, and that's one of the great things about any th good therapy is that unlike trying to work it out with your, your husband or wife at a critical moment, you can try to work it out with somebody who hasn't got a big stake in it, who's who's who can care about you, but whose life isn't going to be determined uh, by you because there's a limitation in what happens outside the therapy. Mm. Although God knows we all end up caring so much about the people we work with anyway. Mm. So it's about relationship and learning. And that that so that's that's therapy. But the same things can happen with a good coach. In, in America, we see a lot of great athletes who have uh, come from uh, from poverty, from inner city poverty, often where there's no no male figure there, and there's gangs around them influencing them. And uh, they tell their wonderful biographies are often told on the sports channels. Some of the best stuff is these biographies on the sports channels. And there's always, uh, if 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 there's no parent there, then there's a couple of probably more than one very strong coach there. Mm. Somebody who who went out of their way to say, uh, you know, you have a place. You have a place in my home for a while if you need it. I'm here. I'm going to take care of you. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, one of the great athletes of all time, such a big, strong man. It's a wonderful um, a program about him on on television. I've never talked about this kind of stuff before, but it impresses me and it has an effect on me. And he took and, and you see him with his arm wrapped around his coach from college, talking about what that man has meant to him. And then you see that man talking about what Shaquille has meant to him. Hmm. And so this healing through having a coach. I had um, a teacher who was so caring toward me and thoughtful toward me that we, and she was to a number of us, that we actually talked the school into giving us four years of Latin so we could have Mrs. Kelty for our Latin teacher for four years. And then she became my, um, my guy, my director, you know, um, the supervisor of our newspaper when I was editor, editor of the newspaper. And and all of this was very foreign to how I was raised. And um, she meant so much to me. Um, so, and then there's religion. You know, I know in Europe, people really mostly frown on religion. A lot of Americans take religion very seriously. It is not a stupid, superficial silliness like people want to portray middle America mm. uh, and people in America who are genuinely uh, religious. And and then uh, the churches provide community. They provide assistance to children, to families in need. And the good ones, and many of them are very good, uh, talk about love. Mm. They talk about love one another. I mean, um, I still remember 
my friend Mary, whom I was dating at the time, I'm Jewish, she was not, and I went to a Sunday church with her ceremony, it was a Methodist church, and the minister was standing up talking about love. I'd never heard anybody talk about love. It was like, I'm a, I think I'm, by then I'm a senior. I'm a senior at that point in high school. Love? It's a man he's talking about. We should love one another? What is this about? And I'm sure that sowed, that moment began to sow the seeds of a lot of my writing later on. <laughs> There's so many things, James, that people can get help from, but it's about loving, caring, relationship, coaching, and guidance. Mm. How's that? That really resonates with my own experiences, Peter, because having seen a couple of psychiatrists for my own issues, I felt there was no therapeutic relationship there at all. And I felt that the psychiatrists that I saw believed that the medication was a worthy replacement for the therapeutic relationship, but I didn't feel it was. I think we've lost touch with the value of that basic human interaction. No, it's poisoning, going to somebody for help and getting poisoned. Mm. So it's it's the exact opposite, getting a drug that makes it hard for you to relate to people because all, all psychoactive substances have a generalized effect on the brain. None of them are specific for your amygdala or something. And so they're all affecting the highest complexes of your brain. Even if you're not stumbling from cerebellar dysfunction, you're getting suppression, disruption of your frontal lobes, your, your amygdala and your temporal lobe, your limbic system. The whole higher functioning of the brain is getting disrupted, which the first thing that happens is you can't quite do that fine, loving, caring, thoughtful tuning that you can when your brain isn't slightly intoxicated, even slightly. That's the first thing to go. Mm -hmm. um, that's why people come home and have a couple of martinis at night when they can't bear, they don't have another way of relating to their husbands or wives after a hard day at the office and with the children running around. It takes the edge off. It makes it possible to to endure the lack of relationship. It seems to be socially acceptable now, doesn't it, to try and deny our emotions rather than teach our children skills to manage and engage with their emotions and their thoughts. Absolutely. And absolutely. And, and, I, and I think the fundamental way is through relationship. I mean, I think teaching, quote, skills and things like that can be helpful, but I prefer the good old idea of you know, we'll, we'll, learning morality, learning to love, daring to love. I mean, we all have in within us to love. That's built into mammals. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's all mammals and their children and in human beings is built into us for a larger number of people. And just uh, cultivating that and learning in each other and in our families and in our children and cultivating responsibility for one another, morality, love. And then psychotherapy becomes an icing that, or at least psychological thinking, what we've learned about applying this to human life and to early trauma, that becomes a, a wonderful avenue to enhancing, enhancing that, that process. Well, Peter, I think if we could instill those principles in how we respond globally to people's struggles with their mental health, the world would be a richer place for taking that approach. Well, absolutely. And it's entirely consistent with a lot of what is taught by good philosophy and religion. You know, this, these ideas are, are quite old about uh, how people should really relate. Um, but they, they never seem to dominate because, uh, which is another whole show, which is that human nature leaves a lot to be desired. desired. <laughs> Whether you believe we came from God or evolution or a combination of it, James, it, it's certainly in each of us, human nature <laughs> leaves a lot to be desired. And uh, if we're evolving, we ain't got there yet. <laughs> um, and so even the best of religious ideas and philosophical ideas then become corrupted. So you have churches based on a, on a, on a, uh, on, on teachings of love that uh, take advantage of people. I mean, so it's we're always dealing with the the inherent problems of both human nature and human large human societies, large human societies. Dr. Bregan, thank you so much for talking with me today. I'm so grateful to be able to get the benefit of your wisdom and experience and be able to share it with the listeners. Thank you, James. Madden America News and Updates. 
On MaddenAmerica.com, we wanted to let you know that the Medication Withdrawal Resources page has recently been updated. This page lists providers for support, educational courses, personal stories, websites for advice, research studies, literature surveys, and video content too. If you need help or advice regarding your psychiatric medications, this is a very good place to visit. From the Madden America front page, choose Resources from the menu, then Drug Info, then Drug Withdrawal Info. If there are resources that we should consider adding to the page, you can let us know by emailing the details to info at maddenamerica.com. Finally, if you're listening in iTunes, please leave us a review and a star rating. Your review will really help to get others listening to our great selection of guests. So thank you so much for listening, and please come back next week for another episode. Until then, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates. 